Hi, everyone. We'll just give it a couple of minutes uh, as participants join to let everyone get here before we get started. Okay. All right, got a number of people on here now, we'll get started. So hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming to our last talk of 2020 for our Criminal Justice Coalition uh, speaker series. I'm Maggie McCann, I'm a 3L student at Dalhousie. Um, I'll be joining the talk tonight in a conversation with our speaker, Patrick McCann. Um, I just want to let everyone know beforehand that it's going to be recorded throughout, um, but none of your, your faces are visible or anything like that. Um, so please ask questions throughout as well. Uh, you can see the questions if you hit the question box just at the bottom. Um, so if you see someone has asked a question that you would like to know more about, you can vote on it to make sure that it gets asked um, right at the top there. So. Uh, tonight we have Patrick McCann here speaking with us and you may have gathered already from uh, the last name that he does happen to be my dad, um, but he is a, uh, a criminal lawyer who's been practicing at the forefront of criminal law for over 40 years. In 1989, he was among the first group of lawyers in Ontario to be certified by the Law Society of Ontario as a specialist in criminal law. He has been cur and currently is listed in the best lawyers in the category of criminal defense. He's represented clients in all trial and appellate courts in Ontario and the Supreme Court of Canada and has also appeared before military tribunals. He has been lead counsel in numerous major criminal trials and has handled over 60 homicide cases. Other cases involve uh, drug trafficking, armed robberies, and commercial fraud. Patrick has been appointed to the list of top secret cleared special advocates appearing in closed national security proceedings. He is a founding member and past president of the Defense Council Association of Ottawa and has lectured extensively at the Ontario Bar Admission course on criminal procedure and related criminal topics. He has also been a guest lecturer at the University of Ottawa, at Carleton University, and at the Canadian Police College. It's quite a bio. Um, and our talk today is about uh, the, uh, the anatomy of a criminal case. So we're going to be talking through a uh, particular case, which uh, my dad will outline, but uh, it's in, it involves a battered spouse defense. So. Uh, I will be in and out, uh, but I will let Dad take over. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Um, hello, everybody. This is a little strange, sort of uh, talking to some people that I can't see. However, uh, let's go. Um, as Maggie said, I'm going to talk to you about a case that involves a battered spouse syndrome. Um, yeah, I picked this case because it's, I think, one of the most significant cases, murder cases I've had. Uh, the case involved a woman by the name of Lillian Getkate, and uh, she, at the time, this happened uh, back in 1995. Uh, she, at the time, was a 35-year-old housewife and brownie leader. She was married to a fellow by the name of Maury Getkate, who was a PhD psychologist employed by the RCMP. They had two children, uh, Dara, who was nine, and Kevin, who was five. I should mention that uh, Lillian was basically half the size of Maury. She was about five foot, and uh, if that, and about 100 pounds, whereas Maury was about six foot two or three and uh, I believe it was 215 pounds. Um, they lived in a small two-story house off Prince of Wales Drive in Ottawa. Uh, and in the early morning hours of December 10th, 1995, sometime between four and 5 a.m., Lillian went down to the basement of their house, picked up a 
223 Mini Ruger sniper rifle with a uh, flash eliminator. And this is significant, I'll mention that later. Loaded it, went back up to the second story of their house to the bedroom where Maury was sleeping and shot him twice in the back. She was charged with first degree murder and I acted for her from about 10 days after the shooting until the end of the process. By the time I became involved, she was already, already been released on bail. But I'm gonna tell you basically almost a narrative here of what happened in my involvement. But before I get to that, I should tell you what happened during those first 10 days. So after the shooting, Lillian called 911, the police arrived. They found her and described her as being distraught. She claimed not to have known what happened. Uh, she was taken to the central police station. And when she was there, she was interviewed by detectives. The, de the interview went on for about two hours and uh, eventually um, Lillian admitted uh, that she had in fact shot Maury. Um, she described what I've just said about going to the basement, loading the gun, going to the bedroom, although she didn't recall pulling the trigger. Um, that statement that she gave would become the basis that the Crown relied on primarily uh, to support a charge of first degree murder by planning a deliberation. Now, <clears throat> the problem here that the, the became a problem obviously for the Crown was uh, at that point after the, finished, the conclusion of that interview, the, uh, the police finally let her call a lawyer. Um, she didn't know any lawyers and the other than one who was uh, the husband of a friend of hers from Brownies. Uh, he practiced almost exclusively in family law and had little or no criminal uh, experience. And he continued to represent her for the next 10 days. And uh, he was able to get her out on bail. Uh, but before that, um, he agreed to let Lillian be interviewed by a crown appointed psychiatrist. Um, the interview took place in the jail. It lasted for three hours. The psychiatrist who interviewed her was Dr. John Bradford, who is probably either the most uh, prominent, if not one of the most prominent forensic psychiatrists in Canada. Um, I've done a number of cases with him and he probably would have been the psychiatrist I would have gone to if he hadn't already been uh, retained by the Crown. Uh, the problem though was that Lillian at the time was in no shape to be given a complete uh, account of the history of the relationship with Maury. Um, she did tell Dr. Bradford to some extent that they had a difficult relationship and she also gave a few examples, which I'll get to later. But the problem was that uh, this basically gave the Crown uh, psychiatric evidence that would, they would use to try to undermine the eventual defense. Um, the lawyer that was representing her, as I said, had little or no criminal experience. And uh, by letting her be interviewed by the Crown psychiatrist, that was something that no, no competent criminal lawyer would do. It gives the Crown far too much of an advantage early on. Most criminal lawyers, and virtually any criminal lawyer I know, would say, no, you can't be, you know, do not talk to any psychiatrists unless they are um, retained by us. So, as I said, Lillian was released on bail, and uh, the main condition was that she lived with her mother, June Fuller. Now, June Fuller was living at the time in uh, Maple Ridge. Uh, British Columbia. She came to Ottawa and rented an apartment that um, she and, and Lillian lived in for several months. Uh, June, I think, quickly realized that Lillian needed representation by a criminal lawyer. So she contacted me and I arranged to meet with the two of them, with her and Lillian. When 
I first met Lillian, I think the first thought I had was, yeah, how could this little woman who was five foot, let's just say about a hundred pounds, be a cold blooded killer? She just didn't look like it. <laughs> she had been, looked like she'd been through, through hell. She looked like 10 years older than, she, than her actual age. She appeared timid, um, afraid of her shadow almost, and she had this gray complexion that was really mousy looking. Um, didn't look like she'd been taking care of herself in any way for, several, for, for some time, not just because she just got out of jail recently or anything like that. But while we first met, when we first met them, June told me that she had suspected for some time that uh, Maury was abusing Lillian, although Lillian had denied it. Since the shooting, Lillian had disclosed to June uh, some very disturbing, a very disturbing pattern, basically, of abuse. And uh, so for the next month, myself and my two partners and our investigator spent much of the time, well, not the investigator so much, not at this point, but uh, myself and my partner spent time interviewing Lillian and going through in great detail the history of their relationship. Um, Lillian spoke mainly to one of my partners who was a female, a woman, and uh, she seemed to be much more comfortable talking to her, certainly particularly when it came to uh, talking about or describing sexual abuse. Um, so basically in the course of these interviews, Lillian described what I think can only be described as a horribly abusive relationship with, uh, with Maury. And I'm going to get into that now. And I'm told that I should perhaps warn people that I'm going to be talking about sexual abuse, uh, very significant sexual abuse. <clears throat> and, uh, which is, is unavoidable because it's an intricate part of the, of what, uh, of what happened here. Um, Lillian described during our interviews that she and Murray had been together for 16 years. Uh, the relationship began normally. I believe she was his first girlfriend, or, or he, excuse me, put that the other way around. Murray was her first boyfriend, as she had not had a relationship with anybody else prior to that. Um, they lived together for about three or four years and eventually got married and uh, it was after they got married, she said, that he became increasingly controlling. Maury began exhibiting angry outbursts uh, when Lillian was pregnant with Dara, and these increased afterwards. Uh, Maury was studying at the time for his uh, psychology PhD and uh, was she, it was, sorry, distracted there because some emails start popping up on my screen. Um, she claimed, he claimed that she was disrupting his studies, having, the chi having a child in the, uh, in the house. And the abuse escalated and uh, Maury started constantly insulting her as being lazy, a dumb bitch, and much worse. Maury began demanding that Lillian submit to his sexual demands whenever he felt like it. He engaged in various forms of forced sexual activity. She described one occasion where they were on top of a top level of a four to five story arcade or parking garage. Maury took her to the railing, pushed her half over the railing and then raped her from behind and then told her how easy it would be to throw her over. Another occasion, he held her at the top of the stairs in their home and threatened to throw her down. Other times, he would drag her upstairs by the hair. So I was just going to ask, do you remember, did, did she start to tell this to her mom or to, to you and your partner? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't quote. I should, to clarify, I did that because my my mom was his legal partner. That's she. She is the the lawyer that he's referring to. Okay, she didn't want me to mention that, but anyway, <laughs> that's true. Okay. Um, uh, but is that was he was she telling this to her mom or to? Yeah, she yeah. Told, well, no. This what I've just described now is the is what she told what she told Tracy during the course of the interviews. Right. Um, 
<clears throat> she had already spoken to June about the abuse in much more detail than she had before. And that's where, uh, you know, partly why June, I think, realized she's got to get herself a real criminal lawyer here and contacted me. <clears throat> anyway, we... Um, out, basically. Yeah. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but among the other things that uh, Maury would do, would he would drag her upstairs by the hair, uh, drag her into the bedroom and, 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 and force sex on her. Um, the other thing that we did, or another thing that we did very early in the process was that um, Lillian had talked about Maury's obsession with paramilitary things, including gun collection and various other weapons and ninja outfits. She said he had literature on the subjects such as stealth and concealment and assassination techniques, explosives and so forth. She said he would go out at night in his ninja outfits and, and he claimed he was training. <clears throat> on a couple of occasions, he, he would be cleaning his guns and would point a gun at her and, and pull the trigger and then tell her that it would be so easy to, to, to kill her. In any event, um, we before I get now, before I get to what we, we, our visit to the scene, I'm going to tell you um, what she told us about the night of the shooting because I think it's probably appropriate we tell you that now. <clears throat> On the night of the shooting, Maury had dragged her upstairs. He had violently raped her with a vibrator. Afterwards, she laid awake for several hours and then went downstairs to Dara's bedroom. She lay down with Dara and within an hour or so, Maury appeared in the bedroom, dragged her out of bed and raped her again in front of the open doorway to Dara's bedroom. And after he finished, he made the comment to her that maybe soon she wouldn't need, he wouldn't need Lillian because Dara was growing up. This was pretty frightening. I mean, uh, to Lillian, she was sure that Maury was soon going to be start abusing Dara. She went back into bed with Dara and sometime later got up, got the gun, as I said, went downstairs where, and uh, went upstairs where Maury was sleeping and shot him. She only had spotty recollection of those actions. So, uh, like I said, during the interviews, uh, Lynn, Lillian told us a lot about the literature and the weapons that Maury had collected. So after the police cleared the house, I went there with uh, our private investigator, a fellow by the name of Russ Taylor. I wanted to view the scene anyway, is that something that I always try to do um, as early as possible in any, any of these types of cases. Um, and while we were there, Russ continued to search through the basement and found uh, a multitude of things that had not been seized by the police. This included, there was books or, and manuals, on, and I'll give you a list here of things that, that it included. Martial arts, militia tactics, ninja fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, hypnotism, phone tapping, assassination, art of invisibility, camouflage, stealth and concealment, computer hacking. He also recovered handcuffs, locks, a machete, and a vibrator. This, what was beginning to take shape here, I think as you can see, is that uh, Maury obviously had a double life. During the day, he went to work as a psychologist, the RCMP. And uh, beyond that, he had this obsession with this paramilitary stuff and ninja uh, outfits and, and weaponry. And um, that in itself tended to terrorize Lillian. <laughs> Dad, was he, um, I know you mentioned that, that like she was aware of it, but was he kind of engaging in, in that practice at home or was he mostly going out to do that stuff? My understanding, he would be go out in his ninja outfits and run around doing stuff. But as, as you'll get to when we get to the trial, the police had actually found uh, a, um, 
and oh, this was something actually Lillian had told us that he was experimenting with, uh, with explosives. But the police had found uh, an improvised explosive device in the basement that was uh, highly uh, ready to go off. Basically, I <laughs> forget the term, <laughs> and uh, it could have been actually could have been could have exploded at any time. Um, although, as it turned out, eventually Lillian wasn't aware of the existence of that, but it just sort of showed the uh, the type of person this guy was, this obsession he had with all of this paramilitary stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, uh, the other thing we had to do was very quickly retain a, a, a psychiatrist now that we couldn't retain John Bradbury. Um, we contacted Graham Glancy, who was a psychologist practicing out of Toronto, who specialized in assessing battered women syndrome. He testified in several other battered women, battered women syndrome trials. And uh, Lillian met with him over the course of two or three days, and did a, he did an extensive workup on her. And uh, within five months, he was able to complete a detailed assessment of Lillian. Uh, as showing all of the characteristics of the battered, wife, battered woman syndrome. <clears throat> um, this, this assessment would form the basis for the defenses we would present at trial. Part of the assessment, uh, as part of the assessment, Dr. Glancy had uh, diagnosed Lillian as suffering from what he described as complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD which he said was a severe form of the disorder and dysthemia, which is a chronic form of depression. Uh, next, we, what we did was we interviewed three of uh, Lillian's brown, Brownie volunteer friends. She had mentioned that she had been out for coffee and socialized to some limited extent with these people. And we decided we needed to interview them as they were possibly the only independent witnesses who could uh, testify to um, Lillian's state of mind leading up to the shooting. The with the interviews, ultimately, we were able to flip the effect of their evidence that uh, when they were called at trial by the Crown, uh, they had all described various observations that fit Dr. Glancy's description of the battered wife syndrome such as uh, Lillian having to call Maury every 10 minutes when they were at Tim Hortons having coffee, uh, only being allowed to be out for an hour at a time. And whenever she was in Maury's presence, she would appear submissive and he was totally dominating of her. As well, they described how he was uh, abusive of the kids, slapping them and uh, inflicting physical punishment to them. Uh, also, during this first six months, um, we managed to team up very quickly uh, Lillian with a, another psychiatrist by the name of Wendy Cole, who was a treating psychiatrist at the Royal Ottawa Hospital. The point of this was for Lillian to actually get some psychiatric help for herself. But, doc, but Dr. Cole ultimately became an important witness, as we explain when we get to the trial. <coughs> So just concluding this part of the, uh, the process, the first six months, when we basically laid the groundwork for the defense. The trial would not take place for another year and two and a half years, but it's something that is so crucial in defending these kind of cases is to get as much information and do as much investigation and preparation as you can at the early stages. So you know where you're going and you can start planning your defense. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, in other cases, it's not possible to do that at an early stage, and you have to wait until you get the Crown disclosure to be able to do any meaningful investigation. Just thought I'd mention that as sort of a roundup, the, the, the practice to do if you're ever going to do trials like these. Uh, between that point and when we got started trial preparation, like I say, almost two and a half years later, uh, there were a couple of things that occurred that uh, played into the narrative. First of all, um, June was anxious to get back to, uh, to back home to British Columbia. So we managed to get the uh, bail conditions changed so that Lillian could go to B 
BC with June and to continue to live with her. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that happened, of course, was the preliminary hearing. The preliminary inquiries back then were all pretty well automatic, although they still are, I think, for homicides. Um, during uh, the preliminary inquiry, we were able to uh, build up the evidence to create a charter challenge for the admissibility of the interview that Crown was relying on for first degree murder. Ultimately, in the pretrial motion, the trial judge would rule that that statement was inadmissible as a violation of the informational component, section 10b of the charter. <clears throat> Before going on any further, I should mention going back to when Lillian went and went back to uh, to the Vancouver area to Maple Ridge with her mother. Um, by the time, like I say, you know, two and a half years later, we came back for trial. Um, she had gained weight, and that was in a good way. She started looking her age. She looked healthy and she smiled a lot. And she was basically a, a bright, normal, healthy looking woman. Um, and it would be difficult and, and then a bit of a dilemma for us as to how then when we got to trial preparation to, uh, um, if you like, bring it back down to ground uh, and go back to reliving the, uh, the events of December 1995 and the lead up to that. Uh, I'll get into that in more detail when we get to the trial, but that, that, that was significant. What had happened was she, she was there, she had, uh, she joined uh, some self-help groups, became involved in, the in, in a support group for uh, battered women, and uh, had gained an enormous amount of self-confidence uh, in the process. Um, the other thing that happened right after the preliminary inquiry was that the Crown then offered Lillian uh, to plead guilty to manslaughter if we would agree to a joint submission of 15 years. And there was no way I was going to recommend that to Lillian and Lillian was not interested in it anyway. <clears throat> so the next step in the narrative is when we get to the trial preparation, getting ready for trial. And in a case like this, we started it, I think about six weeks before the trial date. The preparation, uh, involved basically three things. First, preparing the motions to exclude evidence, which was the only one we did was the motion to uh, exclude the statement, which I've already mentioned. Uh, the other two things are prepare cross-examinations of Crown witnesses and prepare defense witnesses to testify. <coughs> now, the Crown witnesses uh, were basically uh, the police that responded to the scene the, uh, the forensic identification team that uh, searched the, the house afterwards, uh, Dr. Bradford and Brownie friends. Um, the police evidence was very important from our perspective uh, in introducing all of the material that they found uh, in the house when they did these, their search. This is before uh, our investigator got in and found the other things that I was telling you about. <clears throat> the, um, I'll, I'll get into what that was when we get into the trial, but it was significant that we, it was important that we uh, be prepared to, to properly produce all of that, uh, those items. Uh, we already, of course, had the interviews with the Browning witnesses and the all we had to do really was ready those to, uh, to cross-examine the, the Browning witnesses when they were presented by the Crown. Uh, the preparation of, on the other hand, preparation of our own witnesses was another story. Um, the preparation of Dr. Glancy took some time, but only to ensure that I had the right questions to ask to bring out the, the evidence in a way that the jury could understand. Uh, Dr. Glancy, testified many times before and was quite comfortable in relating uh, his evidence without a lot of prompting, but he still, we still needed to make sure we went, uh, covered all the bases, if I can put it that way. The main job was preparing Lillian to testify. Uh, 
and getting her to revisit the horrors you know, that she spent the last two years trying to bury. Most of that work, as I said, was done by my partner uh, who had done the initial interview. And uh, I gotta say, she did a great job. Ultimately, Lillian was an excellent witness. She managed to get her to recall in, in detail all of the, uh, the, the abuse that she'd suffered and was able to do it uh, in a reasonably strong voice that, uh, and, and, and as, as well was able to handle cross-examination by the Crown um, better than we would ever, ever, ever have expected. So, Dad, was yeah. that like I, I find that part of the this case really interesting. So I just wanted to stop for a second there. Do, do you find that that um, is a really big challenge in a lot of cases, or is it like, in particular, I guess with with um, spouse, spousal abuse related crimes. But is that kind of that forward and backward where they're the t in the time that they're waiting for their trial, where they're trying to move forward with their lives and then trying to deal with jury perceptions and stuff? I was I just wanted you to talk a little more on that. Yeah, it, it, um, it happens. This was the this was, I think, the most obvious one that I encountered in my practice where Lillian was like two different people You know, when we first met her. <clears throat> she was, like I say, there was this timid little mouse. And when she came back to get ready for the trial, she was full of brimming with self-confidence, uh, looking so much better and uh, so, uh, you know, uh, well, confident. And the, the, the dilemma, of course, was how to uh, get the jury to understand that uh, what she was like back at the time. And as I say, that was the... the the job that Tracy did and uh, and um, pulled her back into it, uh, it was difficult. Uh, but she got she got, she understood that this is what she had to do, mm -hmm. and was able to be quite dramatic about describing yeah. describing it all. And do you find I don't know if you did this in this case specifically, but um, did you do, do you use like photos of uh, of her at the time and stuff like that? Like, is are there um, or is it more? Is it really just about trying to to work with the witness and and their the way that they deliver themselves on the stand? Okay. Well, the the other thing is that the main help we got in in uh, um, explaining this was through the evidence of uh, Dr. Wendy Cole, the uh, treating psychiatrist. <clears throat> when Lillian came back for the uh, to begin the trial prep, she saw Wendy Cole a couple of times as well again. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dr. Cole was able to uh, able to explain to the jury that uh, the, the incredible difference between the before and after situation that Lillian. Mm -hmm. So um, the trial was in the fall of 1998 and lasted for three weeks. And uh, interestingly, after the Crown opening, I was permitted to give an opening address. Now that's normally not done. In fact, the criminal code says that the defense may open prior to calling the defense. Um, around that time and subsequently, uh, many judges have been permitting defense counsel to give an opening address if they wish after the Crown in order to, particularly if there's a complex defense or, and, and, and if the, uh, the defense is, uh, undertakes it, they will, be, they will be calling evidence. And it was, I think, fairly crucial because we locked into the jury right off the bat what we were going to be doing and what they should be paying attention to and tied in the, the evidence that they were going to hear from the police witnesses about what they had seized at the house and what, uh, and what we would present through our investigator and what Lillian would testify to and what Dr. Glancy would say. Uh, there was normally there's some debate about whether it's a good idea for, to do a, a crown or a defense opening early in the proceedings like that as he could be tipping off the crown to things in the defense that he, they're not aware of. But in this case, there were really, really no secrets. The, the crown was well aware of what the defense was going to be 
working with. <clears throat> so and after the opening addresses, the Crown began by calling the police witnesses. First of all, the witnesses that recounted the scene uh, when they arrived, and then the, uh, the forensic identification witnesses who searched the house. And I'm going to get, again give you another list of the things they found because again I think this this was key to this case this this material that we found that they found <clears throat> they uh, and and this was our beginning the beginning of our establishing this sort of bizarre double life that Maury was leaving was living. Uh, they found various firearms. I'm open to the details of those and ammunition and of course I mentioned the uh, explosive device. But they also found books and manuals about booby traps, sniping, infiltration, lock picking, fake identification, principles of quick kill, surveillance, surreptitious entry, disguise, how to commit crimes leaving no evidence. They also found machetes, various martial arts weapons, and explosives, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> they also introduced the, the mini Ruger that Lillian had used the night of the shooting with a flash eliminator. And I was able to uh, get the, uh, the, the police officer to introduce them to confirm that the only, there is no non-military use for a flash eliminator. The flash eliminator is used by military snipers to uh, hide their location when they're uh, doing their jobs. Uh, again, it was another example of, uh, of Mary's obsession with uh, paramilitary matters. Um, I, I should mention, that I'll, I'll get to that when I get to, to uh, Lillian's evidence, I think, but um, he had Lillian convinced that he could basically disappear uh, at any time he wanted and he could kill her and leave no traces and he would be gone. And she believed that. It was just another aspect of the abuse and, 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 and terror that she lived through. Um, after the police witnesses were called, uh, Dr. Bradford testified. He based, testified basically in line with his report, but uh, in cross-examination, he acknowledged that Lillian had described being dragged upstairs by the hair, which wasn't in his report. <clears throat> The, the Brownies' friends and then were called by the Crown, and as I've already mentioned, uh, they were more helpful to the defense than they were to the Crown. The Crown hoped to get from them, establish with them that uh, Lillian had the opportunity to complain about the abuse to these women, but didn't. Um, and, uh, but as I said, they uh, were also very helpful in giving their um, observations of Lillian at the time, which fit perfectly with Dr. Glancy's evidence of the characteristics of the battered spouse. Uh, at the um, conclusion of the Crown's case, I then brought a, a successful motion for a directed verdict on first degree. Uh, of course, the, the main evidence the Crown had been relying on was the, um, the statement which had been excluded. So they were left with some notes that they found that were found in the, the house uh, in, in written by Lillian, which referred to um, the death benefits that Maury would have through the insurance that he had at the RCMP. Uh, trial judge agreed that, that there was no evidence as to when that was done, and what circumstances was it was done, and uh, couldn't reasonably support uh, the, the finding of planning and deliberation at the time of the murder. Okay, so we then began the defense evidence. Uh, the first witness I called was Russ Taylor, the uh, investigator. And he introduced the, uh, the uh, items he had seized from the home when he and I went there shortly after the, the shooting. <clears throat> and of course, this first further added to the, the picture for the jury of Maury's secret life. Um, that, of course, coupled with everything that the police had seized as well. Uh, we then called Lillian to the stand. And she testified, testified to all of the abuse that she described in her earlier interviews, and I won't repeat it all. And as I said before, that she was an excellent witness and was certainly held her own on cross.
cross-examination. The next witness we called was Dr. Clancy. He began by describing the characteristics of uh, battered women syndrome and why some women and men uh, cannot disclose the abuse as it escalates. Uh, the reasons include self-blame, he said, fear of retaliation, fear of losing custody of their children. He explained that uh, psychological and sexual abuse is more debilitating than physical abuse as it's aimed at destroying the self-worth of the woman. Um, the defense would eventually advance three defenses. Self-defense, which would result in a full acquittal. Lack of intent to kill, which would result in a conviction for manslaughter. And provocation that would result in a conviction for manslaughter. Um, Dr. Glancy's evidence was key to all three of them. Self-defense, as we know, required that Lillian reasonably believed that death or serious harm was imminent and that she couldn't otherwise defend herself. Although Lillian told Dr. Glancy that she feared Maury would eventually kill her, uh, that didn't help the imminence requirement, but she also had the fear of ongoing sexual abuse, abuse which I felt and Dr. Glancy agreed would uh, consist of fear of uh, imminent fear of uh, serious harm. Uh, Dr. Glancy's evidence as to why Lillian believed she could not leave supported the absence of the alternative requirements. Those are the, the, the items I mentioned earlier in describing the, uh, the syndrome. Dr. Glancy's diagnosis of dysthemia and complex uh, PTSD, uh, with, he said, would certainly interfere with Lillian's ability to form the necessary intent. So that addressed the second line of defense, the lack of intent to kill. Uh, it also supported the provocation requirement that, Lily, that Lillian was deprived of self-control by Nori's actions and that she acted before there was time to cool off. That's very, very summary form of what the defense of provocation is. <clears throat> the final defense witness we had was Dr. Coleman, as I mentioned earlier. She was important uh, in, 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 in being able to speak to the drastic change between Lillian and their, their first meeting and Lillian at trial. Um, she also was able to give a, her own opinion as a psychiatrist supporting Dr. Glancy's diagnosis. Um, I don't know if I'm running out of time here. I was going to th throw in something about the reply evidence. I'll, 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 no, you're good. Yeah, no, okay. I'll, 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 I'll talk very quickly because it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the Crown then in reply called um, three or four of uh, Maury's colleagues from work to say what a great guy he was at work and what a good psychologist he was and how everybody respected him, etc. cetera. Um, the, the simple thing in cross-examination was then to show them all of the array of, uh, of weaponry and outfits and, and, and literature that had been found in the house and asking them that this was this consistent with their view of uh, Maury at work? And they all shook their heads in disbelief and said, no, that's totally inconsistent uh, with Maury. And that, that just just cemented, in my view, the, uh, the idea of Maury living two sort of basically a double life, one of uh, the, you know, an upstanding member of society as a psychologist, the other as a terror, a terror basically, a, 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 I'd say a domestic terrorist, <laughs> if you use domestic in the sense of a marriage or a relationship. So that, that was the end of the evidence. Uh, the next step with the jury addresses, and I won't go into that in details, the main focus of my jury address was uh, basically asking the question of the jury, like how could this timid doormat of a person with no history of violence or aggression shoot her sleeping husband unless, you know, basically she could not see any other way out of the nightmare that she was in. Um, the judge then charged the jury and they retired to consider their verdict. Now they were out four days and I gotta tell you, I was having 
more than my usual anxiety waiting for the verdict. Um, I primarily because of who Lillian was. I mean, what if they found her guilty of murder and the thought of her getting an automatic life sentence was very frightening. Uh, and, and on top of that, I've had a long-standing distrust of juries, although they're not supposed to. Jurors do occasionally speak to us after the trial and tell us things that impressed them and didn't impress them. And uh, uh, some of the things that I've heard from jurors have, uh, are very disturbing and lead you to believe that they never really understood the issues or the, the, the legal issues anyway and, and, and the, or the uh, the effect of the evidence. So all of that added to my anxiety, of course. And, uh, uh, but eventually, after four four days, the, the jury came back, much to my relief, found Lillian not guilty of murder, but did find her guilty of manslaughter. Now, as I say, I was relieved for that because uh, I wasn't really hanging my hat on a not guilty verdict on, based on self-defense as that is a bit of a stretch in these circumstances when uh, it, it, it happened over a period of time. But um, once we had the, ver the manslaughter verdict, we weren't tied into a, some joint, crazy joint submission like 15 years. I was pretty confident that with all of the, uh, the, the, the psychiatric evidence and the, all the character evidence that June Fuller had managed to put together for us, uh, and knowing that the judge appeared to be sympathetic to Lillian's situation, I was pretty sure that we, would, that we could keep her out of jail. Um, and ultimately, that's what happened. Um, we kept her out of jail. She was sentenced to two years less a day to be served in the community, which is a conditional sentence under Section 742.1. And uh, that is the end of the story. Um, I could say a little bit about, uh, if there is time, a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the the reaction in the media after that, and the reaction of the Crown's office. Uh, the, have you got time for that? Yeah. Okay. The, um, the Crown attorney uh, handled the case was a, a woman by the name of Julianne Parfat who I, happens to be uh, somebody I've done a number of trials with, and I like her very much, but, uh, and generally she's a pretty decent crown. But just give me a second, I'm just gonna pull something up. I'm, I don't know if this will get me there, but yeah, it does. Um, but she went a little bananas after the verdict, after the, after the sentencing, um, and I'm, I'm Referring to, if, if any, any of you want to get into the real uh, the weeds on this case, um, Elizabeth Sheehy, who's a, Sheehy is a uh, law professor at Ottawa U, has written a book on the uh, on, uh, battered women syndrome and devotes a chapter to the Get Kate case. And she talks about, at the end of it, about uh, the response to the or reaction to the, to the sentencing. And she, she wrote, Parfit contested the sentence. She took the unusual step uh, of speaking to the news media, calling the sentence an appalling message to send to the public and claiming that there was no corroborating evidence that Lillian was abused, which was obviously not true. Wow. Uh, they, they, they had lots of corroborating evidence on it. Yeah. Um, then that led to, uh, okay, I think I may be stuck here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. My no computer's problem. cooperating. Anyway, then there were a series of, uh, of editorials and comments and stuff in the news media. Uh, yeah, basically talking about license to kill and uh, that, the, you know, that all you have to do is say you're abused and uh, you're going to get off, you get away with murder. Um, ultimately, and, and also trashing the trial judge, you know, un, totally unfairly for uh, imposing the sentence, even though it was backed up by the you know, amply supported by other cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I wound up writing a letter to the editor on it, which I was going to try to quote from, but I can't get it back up quickly on my computer, um, in, in which I 
sort of basically went to the judge's defense because judges can't go to the press and write to the press and defend themselves. And uh, occasionally, once in a while, I think you have to do that. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. So I don't know if anybody's got questions, but uh, that's it for my presentation. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. So thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. McCann, for, for your talk. Um, all right, we've got three questions right now. So um, I'm just trying to think of which one makes the most sense to ask first. Um, okay, so actually, most relevant to to the end of the talk, um, were there no ethical implications of the Crown's comments to the press? <laughs> um, I think there are. <laughs> I think there are. Um, the, uh, the irony it is that the, the actual the, the Crown attorney for uh, Ottawa um, backed up uh, Julian Parfait and said similar things. Uh, you know, crowns have done that before. I think it's totally unethical to take shots. That they, I've had them take shots at the judges uh, in the press, uh, and nothing happens to them. You know, they're, they're, they all think they're, you know, to some extent, they feel they're above them. They answer to a higher God, you know, that type of thing. Right. Um, okay. Uh, the. Question. So. Um, it seems like you did have a lot of evidence before Crown Disclosure. Was this mostly conducted on your part and the doctor instead of the police? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the police did very little in the way of investigation other than, uh, you know, they'd established that, 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 uh, that uh, Lillian had shot Maury. And, uh, it, and that was sort of basically where they stopped. They did seize all these this stuff from the house, which was very helpful to us, but yeah. Um, we got on it right away. I mean, this was, uh, you know, dealing with this kind of, any kind of a psychiatric case like this, um, you got to get on it. You got to get psychiatrists involved. You got to make sure you get, you know, start looking for evidence that will support the, uh, the psychiatric, um, diagnosis that you're hoping that you will get. Uh, and, but the same is true with other cases too. I mean, the earlier you can get into investigating it, the better. Do you have, um, when you. Uh, and, and so you mentioned earlier that you like to go to the crime scene yourself whenever possible. And I was kind of curious, actually, and I forgot to ask at the time. Um, are, are crime scenes closed off to, to um, defense counsel or anything like that? Like, is that, uh, is that de dependent on the case or how does that tend to work? Well, it, it, it's sometimes complicated because there's, the police, first of all, will cordon off the area where there's a crime if it's outside or will, you know, uh, close the house where the, uh, the shooting takes place until until they've completed their investigation, and you can't get in while that's happening. And you might be able to go if you you know with a in certain circumstances it might be possible, but normally no, you wouldn't get in while the uh, until the, the police have completed their their investigation. <laughs> um, sorry, there was another part to your question. What was it? The I was just uh, I guess um, the at, like at at what point so you said already that you like you wouldn't be able to get in before the police are done their investigation but is it case dependent on whether you're able to get in afterward like is it yeah i mean you know it's it, it, sometimes you know it happens on somebody's private property and you've got to get permission from the owner of the property to go in and see it um <clears throat> there was uh yeah depending on the situation they may not be anxious for that to happen but, you know, I, I don't, I'm trying to think if I've ever had, ever been refused. I don't think so. But no. uh, we've had to, I've had to, you know, I've had to ask for permission and make all kinds of undertakings and stuff uh, yeah. before we go in sometimes. <clears throat> but most, you know, most murders I've been told would actually take place outdoors. So that's not a problem. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so. Um, do you think it would be easier to run a case like this today, given the changes in the law of self-defense? You know, I don't know that it would be any different. Um, I think I, I think what is key in the law, quite frankly, is the uh, is the Lavalley decision, 
where Justice Wilson um, basically takes issue with the concept of uh, imminence. That, that she notes that that's not really in the code, that never was in the code, and that um, it has it um, is really sort of a judge-made requirement in the, in the jurisprudence. And she said basically says it should be, you know, taken on a case by case basis. And in situations like this, imminent doesn't mean immediate. <clears throat> it could be sort of something that you're know is coming or you feel is coming and, uh, and it's not much and you can't get away from it yeah i mean in this in this case too there was only so much like what is she going to wait for you know like for for him to be coming at her with a weapon when he is has been training as a a combat artist i guess i don't know how else to call that yeah, yeah but, no. uh, and the size difference too i know you noted that but but i think for in terms of the imagery of, of um, you know, the reality of suggesting that someone should be in the moment in a threat uh, to, to have a valid self-defense seems a little bit crazy when you consider that type of circumstance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure whether the, you know, the, the amendments to the self-defense and the criminal code would have any bearing on it. I don't think it would. I think, it, you know, the same principles still apply. I mean, really what happened when they amended the criminal code was they just simplified the uh, the criminal, the, uh, the defense, basically adopting what uh, the jurisprudence or how the jurisprudence had uh, interpreted the previous provisions. Mm. Okay, so we've got one more question. Um, do you think that if the self-defense would have failed, that provocation may have been successful with the jury? Well, it had to be the provocation or or uh, lack of intent. I'm not sure which one it would have been. I would have think more likely lack of intent. But then the other thing, the other thing, of course, is it could have simply been a compromise verdict, mm -hmm. where you know some of the jurors wanted to wanted wanted to convict her of murder. Some of the jurors wanted to acquit her, and they just sawed it off at manslaughter. That, that sort of thing happens on jury trials, I think. And, and that's another reason why I don't like jury trials. <laughs> not not always consistent with the law, I guess. Is yeah. that a, a form of jury nullification? Uh, no, not really. Not really, because there were defenses there. I mean, there was, you know, the evidence supported the verdict. I don't think it was. Uh, right, they're just, they're just averaging their opinions. Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. I, I, I you know, I, I know it happens. It's happened in a lot of jury trials, and, and where um, <laughs> I, 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 won't, I got stories I could tell you. It would take way too long, but um, <clears throat> the old courthouse in Ottawa actually had a. If you went into the press room, it was right beside one of the uh, jury rooms, and if you went there and uh, and, and listened to them while they were arguing. You could actually hear what they were saying. <laughs> never, never told anybody. Oh, well, there was a few of us knew about it, but uh, that's certainly not the case anymore. That was many years ago. And that's that's in the press room. They can hear. It was in the press room. The press room was right beside the uh, or adjacent to the to the to the jury the, the jury deliberation room. Mm -hmm. And I guess the walls were a bit thin. It was an old courthouse, and uh, soundproofing wasn't great. It, just, it seems like that would be particularly exciting for the for the press. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the guy that the, um, the reporter from the Citizen at the time was the one that told me about it here. That, that they didn't, and of course, never never disclosed it, and, and nobody ever disclosed it. It was just a, a secret amongst the people that knew about it. But right. Not much you could do about it, but I mean, it was uh, it, you know it was kind of interesting to hear that they were. Yeah. Some of the things they were talking about. You couldn't hear everything, but you could certainly hear some of the stuff they were talking about. And we had one case where the jury went out to, um, and uh, yeah, I won't get into that. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I, I, could be, I could be telling tales on people that. I, I, <laughs> okay. Well, that's perfect timing, anyways, because we're we're pretty well just at seven. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, thank you so much, Dad, for for joining us for this talk and for sharing your your stories. This is super interesting, and um, I would like to encourage everyone to uh, follow our social media. We're on uh, Facebook is the um, uh, the uh, Dalhousie uh, Cr Criminal Law Students Association is our Facebook page. For uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's the uh, Criminal Justice Coalition. And uh, you can find out about uh, our speaker series for 2021 on there. And you can uh, learn about our faculty and our students, our alumni and uh, other cool events that are happening. So definitely check out our social media and uh, this talk, if you weren't able to catch all of it, or if you know someone else who is interested, this talk will be uh, up on our Schulich School of Law YouTube page. Uh, usually we get them up within two to three days, so it should be there pretty soon. Um, yeah, and that's it. So thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.